Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> so we've been sitting for a while, and so I'm wondering, like, is what people need now, like, a lecture? <laughs> How about a nice lecture, everybody? Would you like a lecture? Um, but I'm not really quite sure what else to do. Um, I mean, I could do my, my little dance, you know, and entertain you for a while, or we could all do that. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll say some things, and then maybe something else will happen. Um, yeah. You could lecture for a long time. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, appreciating the, some, of those, some of those slides, and, and uh, um, as I was uh, watching Aaron's presentation, I was thinking of what I might want to say. And I thought I'd pick up on the theme of money, which also came up in some of, I mean, usually when people talk about economics, they're talking about money, which already is part of the problem. Originally, the word economics was a lot broader than um, money. Uh, really what it is about, it's the way, well, to go back to the root uh, oikos, uh, the ways of keeping home, the ways of, of taking care of each other. Or you could say uh, the, the, the ways that human beings connect gifts and needs, the ways that human beings coordinate labor and creativity and make collective decisions about what to create, um, how to use resources, and how to relate to the human and other than human world. All of that should go under economics. It's understandable why economics has come to mean the study of money. Because all of those things I have named are being subsumed underneath the money umbrella. Even in my own lifetime, there's a lot of human activity, a lot of relationships that have become monetized that were not when I was a child and certainly not when my father was a child. Like, for example, things like, like well, childcare. We rarely paid for that when I was a kid. Like, it was a rarity that you would send your kid to, to uh, pre-K. There wasn't such thing as pre-K uh, because People, not only like housewives watching the kids, but the neighborhood kind of watched the kids. There was always something to do. You'd go outside and you'd play with other kids. Play was not something you purchased. Childcare was not something you purchased. Cooking was not something you purchased. If you go back another generation, entertainment was usually not something you purchased. My father tells when he was a kid, this is the 1940s, Every Sunday afternoon, the whole neighborhood would get together. People would have guitars. They would sing folk songs. Where this, was that? That's this was, awesome. <laughs> yeah, and this was not in like, you know, like hippie village. This was in like a normal American suburb in St. Louis. Like this was normal for human beings. So all of those things and many, many more have become, have migrated into the money realm. And that means that the economy grows. Anytime that you do something for somebody and you're not getting paid, then that does not count as part of the economy. But if you pay for it, like, like if I, like say like, you know, um, you know, you babysit somebody's kids and you don't pay and they don't pay you, but then like they have you over for dinner and you don't pay them for dinner. No. That is not considered an economic good and service by an economist. Mm -hmm. It's only an economic good and service if you go to a restaurant, if you pay a professional babysitter. So here we have more and more of human activity entering into the monetized realm to the point where, where you can have like a close friend. And I mean, I've had this experience like I have a friend who does like a certain amount of relationship counseling, you know, but she's kind of thinking of getting into that, you know, but she's not like a professional and like, like, 
this was years ago, you know, and I call her up, you know, and get her advice. And she's like, okay, I'm creating a program, you know, and, and like all of a sudden she wants me to pay for it, pay for it. Like this is even friendship migrates into the monetized realm. It's called life coach. You know, the, 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 oh, the functions, the life coach. <laughs> like the function, the function that was once served by wise elders, by, by wise uncles, by wise grandmothers, by, by, um, uh, shamans, you know, like that function has also become monetized. So when you look at statistics, like you were showing about the percentage of the world that lives on less than $10 a day, less than $5 a day, less than $1 a day, how is that possible? Like, could you live on less than $5 a day? Gosh, those people must be miserable, huh? It's possible because they still live to some extent in a gift economy. They source what they need without money. They don't pay for childcare. They don't pay for insurance. Because if your house burns down, then people get together and help you build a new one. You don't pay for, for uh, you know, movies and things to download on your device. There's things happening in the village. You don't pay for many of the things. And so, you, of course, you can live on less than $5 a day. Are you a hundred times more miserable than somebody who lives on $500 a day? No. Probably not. Because where do you find the happiest people on earth? <laughs> is it in the Hamptons? <laughs> <laughs> or is it in a remote village in Bangladesh? Probably. Or among the Caro? Or like pretty much anywhere if, you, if you've traveled the world, you know, even in places where there is like genuine like destitution, like where people are, are food insecure. Still, they, they, they generally speaking, they seem a lot happier. Sometimes because they have community, because they have relationships to, to, to place, to people, to place, to community, to nature, to the soil, to the water, to the, to the, to the features of the land. They have a name for everything that they see. And it's not just a name. It's not just like you go to, to your botany app and you can name and memorize the names of these plants. They have a relationship with those plants. Maybe they use it for medicine. Maybe they use it for food. Maybe they use it to, to make stuff. Maybe they have a story about that particular hill where something happened to my aunt. And so everything is woven together. Though that, that's called wealth. When we don't have that, then we need money to at least get some compensation for what has been lost. So how, how has this happened? Huh. Maybe I'll tell you a little story here. Um, I think this is the one I'm gonna, gonna offer for your book. Um, it's a, a game of musical chairs, okay? So, I mean, you can imagine us getting together and playing a game of musical chairs. You know how, how you play, the music plays, and there's, there's, how many people here? 50 people, but only 45 chairs are set up. And so when the music turns off, then everybody rushes for a chair, and if you're without a chair, then you lose, and you're out of the game, okay? So once upon a time, there was a big game of musical chairs like this. And um, they made it more interesting, though. Hundreds of people, uh, but a few less chairs than that. 5% less chairs. But if you miss a chair, if you don't get a chair, not only are you out of the game, but you lose your house, and you can't feed your kid, and you don't get medical care. Ooh. All right, make the game interesting, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then, so the, the music stops and everybody goes for the chair and you see people pushing and elbowing and shoving and, and just this free for all because people are desperate to get a chair. And maybe a few altruistic souls forego their chair and let the pregnant mother have the chair instead. Those are the altruistic exceptions to the general rule of human nature. And watching this melee is a committee consisting of an economist, a politician, um, who else should we add in there? A priest, how about a priest? 
Um, well, that'll, that, that'll, that'll count as the economist. There's some, some, some viewers, you know, and, and a biologist. Let's say that, too. And, and the economist says, look at that. Human nature maximizing rational self-interest, that proves it. And the biologist says, yep, that's what it is. Just like in nature, maximizing reproductive self-interest, red in tooth and claw. And the politician says, yeah, lucky thing to have us around to keep order. Otherwise, they tear themselves apart. We make some rules, at least, that they can't kill each other for the chairs. And the priest says, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go in there and convince them to be nicer to each other. Instill some morality. What nobody is asking and what we have to ask is why, who decided that there were going to be less chairs than there are people? And this translates into the debt question, because if you haven't noticed, our current economy looks very much like that game of musical chairs. And it doesn't matter how, yeah, I mean, you can be a nice person and forego your chair and be really generous and support others and not try to exploit them. But then you end up without a chair. You end up without the ability to make a living, to pay for food, to pay for all the things that are no longer provided by a gift economy. So this obviously does not serve the people who are left out, it does not serve the people who are desperately striving to keep their heads above water and make their debt payments. And ironically, it doesn't even serve the people at the top of the top of the pyramid. They get a substitute for real wealth. If that's all there is, then yeah, you're better off at the top of the pyramid than at the bottom. But does it have to be a pyramid? What happens if you organize the game differently? What if you have an equal number of chairs as people? Then there's still maybe some competition. Maybe some of the chairs are more comfortable for some people than others. Some are higher. Some are good for people with long legs. You know, so people, people like different chairs. There's some trade. There might still be some competition, but it won't be baked into the rules of the game like it is now. And it's simply because of the way that money is created as interest-bearing debt, which means, as I think you were saying, um, means there's always more money than there is debt because it's lent into existence. More debt than money. That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> more debt than there is money. Um, and I don't know, if, like, uh, it feels like a bit too luxury to explain that. People had, used to have no idea, and now it's pretty well known mm -hmm. how money is created. So I'm not going to really bother to, to go through that whole process. Um, but basically what it means is that we're always in competition with each other for never enough money. So... I'd like to talk about reversing that and also to make it maybe appropriate, like relevant on a local level, not just on a systems level. On a systems level, I mean, we could talk about negative interest systems. We could talk about other monetary systems that do not, that are not created as interest bearing debt. Um, and that gets, there's like all kinds of details that are not interesting to everybody here. So I'm probably not going to talk about them a lot. Uh, but, you know, for negative interest systems, there's a problem with centralized control. Um, and anyway, it's a, it's a, rather, it's a, it's a rather long discussion. Um, but I, but I, I do want to talk about reversing this progression of life into money, of relationships into services, and of nature into products that has been going on for a very long time. And that, that is, uh, I'll, and I'll, I'll relate that to the game of musical chairs. Because, because money is lent into existence. If I'm a bank, who am I gonna lend money to? Am I gonna lend it to Josie, who wants to start a revolution roll call? And, and I'm like, okay, that sounds beautiful, Josie, um, so you want um, $500,000, uh, what's your business plan to pay me back? Are you gonna be charging people a lot of money for a revolution roll call? 
You know, it sounds great, but you know, how are you gonna pay me back? Don't have a business plan, okay, you know. Sorry, I guess I, I really can't lend you that money even though I'd like to because the bank has gotta make a profit. I'm in competition with other banks and there's regulators looking over my shoulder, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately it goes down to we're all compete, like this bank is not alone in competing for never enough money. Sorry. Instead, I will find someone else. Um, like Greg, yeah? Like maybe you have a business plan, uh, which is, you know, like there's this wetlands out there and I'm gonna pave it over and build a strip mall. And, and I'm like, let me see your business plan. And you show me the numbers, I'm like, yeah, that looks pretty good. There's money in that. And you're like, maybe you're even like, you know, Charles, I really don't wanna do that, but um, you know, my other business plan didn't get a loan, so here we are. And so, okay, so basically, here's the general principle. I, the bank, or really the entire financial system in aggregate will lend money to those investments that are gonna be able to pay them back, that are gonna be able to generate even more money. And that's how the whole system works. More and more money has to be lent into existence to pay back the interest on the previously lent money, which means the economy has to grow and grow and grow forever. The economy has to grow forever, otherwise it stops working. And when it stops working, you get defaults, you get depression, you get economic depression, you get layoffs, you get, you get um, uh, investment freezing up. <clears throat> so the government is under huge pressure to maintain a positive rate of return on capital. They set up the whole system to facilitate people like me lending money to people like Greg. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so, so that's, that's how the game of musical chairs is related to, to endless growth. And that is why over the course of my lifetime, more and more has entered the money realm. And now we have a chance to go the other direction. To reclaim life from money. And that part of that is on a systems level. Like, like all those beautiful organizations that, that Aaron showed us, they're kind of going against the current. Not everybody can do that in the current system. A systems change is necessary too. However, what these uh, companies and organizations and individuals are doing is they're creating a template for a different kind of economy. And they're normalizing a different way of thinking. And they're creating relationships that, will, that are, are, are kind of on the margins of the dominant system now, but, but if and when the dominant system freezes up and collapses, or there's a moment of crisis where we awaken to the choice that is actually inherent in our systems that we are, have been blind to, then we have the seed of something new. And so I see in Boulder, just from, you know, I've had a bunch of visits here, you know, and I, 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 I know that there's a lot of that actually going on. People rebuilding structures of reciprocity, rebuilding systems of gift, rebuilding community. People who in one way or, an, or another are doing things for each other and it's not because they're being paid to. This um, is a form, you could even call it a form of, of investment um, called, called um, generosity which is the, well, two elements, one of the two elements of gift economy. One element is generosity, the other element is gratitude. Yeah. One time I was speaking at an economics conference. Uh, obviously it was not a mainstream one. 
Um, and 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 the the speaker before me, uh, God, I haven't told the story for a long time. I, I you know I mean I don't talk about sacred economics that much anymore because I wrote that book like quite a long time ago. But anyways, someone the speaker before me was talking about uh, the the um, the delusion of what he called fiat currency and the necessity to move to gold. And he said, it's all going to fall apart and you better have physical gold. And okay, for one thing, I'm going to detour from my detour here. <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with fiat currency. What fiat means is to declare something into existence. And money fundamentally is a declaration. It is an agreement among human beings. It is a story of value. Even gold actually has value because people agree that it has value. It's true. I mean, yeah, it, you can make, it's kind of useful. You can make pretty things out of it. It's good for electronics, you know. But if it were that useful, then it would not be the case that two-thirds of all the gold ever mined is sitting in vaults. Yeah. Dug with, in, with intense effort from one hole in the ground and put in another hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and it's economically, I mean, environmentally devastating. Scarcity. Gold mining. Yeah. yeah, it's insane. Anyway, so there's nothing wrong with fiat. And in fact, we have to embrace actually embrace the, the social and political dimension of money. It is about human agreement. We cannot escape that and export that onto an algorithm. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm not actually against cryptocurrency. I'm just saying that those politics then just take a step backward and they are, they're um, embodied in the algorithm itself. Who decides what algorithm to use? Who decides who gets to create money? That is a sacred function. The creation of money is a sacred function. In every society, ancient societies, it was the king or the, the, the temple that created money. And, and, and so today, it is the Federal Reserve that creates money. That can be questioned. But we have to remember that it is a sacred function. Anyway, so I, so, so I got up and I gave my talk. And one of the questions was, well, Charles, what do you think about gold? You know, don't you think that we should have some physical gold in case of economic collapse? And I said, if there's a collapse to that degree where like even the dollar is worthless, <laughs> probably the most dangerous thing you could do is have large amounts of physical gold. Because <laughs> <laughs> men with guns will come and take your gold. And, and unless you're going to, like, unless you aspire to be a warlord, you know, and like, like hire lots of guys with guns, you know, and pay them and prevent them from like taking the gold, you know, and having some system of control. Like, I don't know, maybe some of us are cut out to be a warlord here, but, but like most people probably don't have that particular skill set. So, you know, one person who does this. Yeah. And we did not go to his South place. America, yeah. yeah so, okay. So there are guys who do that, but, but generally speaking, you know, Men with guns will come and take your gold. You don't want to have a lot of gold. What do you want? What, what survives collapse? What survives crisis? Community. Yeah, <laughs> community. Yeah, people will come to your bunker and take all your stuff, you know? Like, and, and even if they don't, even if you have your AR-47s and you're like protecting it all, what kind of life is that? That kind of sucks. So as I said, the best investment you can make is generosity. Because whatever you give to the community and you generate that goodwill and you generate those structures of taking care of each other, that is a, an, an investment. That is a savings account that, that fires cannot burn and thieves cannot steal. What you give is the only thing that cannot be taken. When through a transition in state. And that's actually even true through the death process. Like, you're, it, it's, it's the same, the same basic energetic configuration. There you are in your deathbed. And you can't take any of it with you, can you? Nope. You can't take your money, you can't take your possessions, you can't take your reputation. You know, wherever you're going, no one remembers what you did here. You know, you can't take anything with you. What what do you think about in those times? What, what is in the world and, and cannot be lost? It's what you've given to the world. 
And at some point in their lives, everybody realizes this. And, 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 and as death approaches, that realization becomes more and more lucid. And you see, in, at least in a society with um, healthy transitions to elderhood, you see that is what elderhood is. It's, it's an elder, somebody who knows they're going to die and has really taken that in. And they become very generous. They're not, in, they're not ambitious anymore. And so there you are on your deathbed and everything that you've given, that is, that's where your joy is. And in some sense, and then you could have, you know, teachings of heaven or karma or something where, where in fact you do kind of take it into the next existence. But anyway, if we are facing a time of turbulence, and I think we are, where everything that had seemed reliable is proven to be a mirage. And it can happen. You know, wealth can, be, can evaporate overnight. Or it can be confiscated. It can disappear in many ways. Then what do you have? How do you be resilient in coming times? It's a kind of a paradox. That, that question might come from self-interest. How do I protect myself in coming times? But the answer is that it can't be just about myself. It's the community that I forge. And, that, and community is built from two elements, from gift and from story. And I would like to see this, this realization take hold just as it does in a person approaching death, where you understand now what's important. I would like it to take hold in a civilization and in a society that is also in a death process. And I'm not saying that civilization is going to go extinct, but it's a metamorphosis. What is ending is society as we know it, potentially. It's actually to think that it was inevitable, that we would transition to a more beautiful world because the crises would converge and birth us into a new world through a, a process of, of collapse and rebirth, like a, like a birth process, expelled, expulsion from the womb. And now I, I, I come to think that, it, that it's more of a series of choices, of intensifying severity of conditions where it's like an addict on the downward spiral. When does he hit bottom? For one person, it might be when, when his wife runs out, leaves him. For another person, it might be when he gets sent to prison. For another person, you know, it might be like not until he ends up in the hospital. And for some people, they're, they're still smoking cigarettes through their tracheostomy oh, tube. You know, that's how addicted they are. Like, where, where do you hit bottom? Like, there's a series of choices here. So what I can say, I cannot, I will not say that, that crisis and collapse are going to save us. Save us from what? Save us from our choice? Save us from our agency? No. But they have a, they bear a gift. And the gift is that they illuminate choice. They give us an opportunity to choose consciously to say, wow, we've been going in this direction blindly. This direction of, of, of phony wealth, this, this direction of monetization, this direction of, of, the, of um, domination of nature. And we were blind to it, but now we see. And we have a, an opportunity to take a different direction. And so this is the significance of the work of a lot of people in this room. You're, you're, showing what that alternative choice could be by example. What it could be for agriculture. When, when the crisis lands and there's this moment of this is not working. There's something else that has been developed on the margins and that is now ready. And, and you could say the same thing about education, um, the same thing about about healthcare, like 
I'm sure many people in this room are, are, are creating the seeds of a future world. These are, are elements of a, of a different timeline than the one that we are on that shows itself into our timeline. And I would also say maybe that, that um, in a way, money has served us well. Money as we know it. Money as created by interest-bearing debt. Generating competition, compelling growth. It has suited humanity in um, a growth phase. And we've been, as a civilization, we've been like children, uh, growing up, developing our gifts, taking from the mother, which is normal for a child to take without question from the mother. That time is or should be ending. And we're understanding that now. We're understanding that there's a limit to what we can take if we want to have a living planet. I don't think ecological collapse is going to save us either, though. The future that I'm afraid of is not one where we destroy the environment and we go extinct. That, that, that's not as bad as what I'm afraid of, which is that we destroy the environment and we don't go extinct. Oh. And we, have, have, we live on, on an entire planet that's been made into one big toxic waste dump and parking lot with almost nothing alive. And, <laughs> and growing all our food in factories and hydroponics farms Lab, lab grown meat, you know, like precision fermentation, um, uh, carbon capture machines to, to modulate the atmosphere, you know, spraying, the, bleaching the sky white with sulfur aerosols and aluminum particles. I mean, these experiments are already happening, actually. Everything I'm saying is underway. I mean, you think that, that, we, that, we, that we just would not accept a dead planet? Well, guess what? We're already two thirds of the way there. Do you guys know about the insect apocalypse, yep. you know, like somewhere, depending on the place, 80 to 94% of insects are gone. You don't see bug splatter on the windshield anymore, do you? What I haven't happened? seen that in about a decade or more. Yeah. I mean, it used to be like, you'd have to have like, you have to have your windshield wipers on sometimes. I remember. Yeah. yeah. What happened to that? Oh. You know? So, so we're already like 80 or 90% of the way there. If we're going to change, it isn't going to be because we're finally forced to change. That would have already happened. It's already bad. It has to be a choice. A choice of what? A choice that we're going to live on a living planet. We're going to devote our society to beauty instead of growth. To cooperation instead of domination. It's a choice. And that choice lands on us personally every day. And through the personal choices we make every day, we issue a declaration to God, a prayer that says, here is what I want. Here is what I'm praying for. and I'm proving it by my choice. We're, 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 we're making a statement about human nature. Here is the choice a human being does when there is a choice between life and control. Between life and safety, between gift, and domination. Here's the choice a human being makes. And each one of those choices generates a morphic field. And the same choices start happening everywhere else. So it's a choice. And I, I, I guess I want to, you know, and, and this is something like, so like obviously here, this is what you might call a spiritual dimension to economics. Like, yeah, your individual choice, there's no rational pathway by which that's going to change the entire system. But for sure, 
if you do not make that choice, what hope do you have that those in power will make the equivalent choice? Or anybody will make that choice if you're not making it. And that's why I like to say that cowardice births despair. So we see that there's a, there's a, a spiritual dimension to the economic question, which is kind of obvious, right? Like we look at the economic crisis and we know that, that this isn't just like some technical tweak that we can make to fix the problem. This crisis goes all the way down to the bottom of what it is to be human in our time. And what we are called to do is to launch a different kind of human beingness than what we have been brought up in, a different relationship to each other, a different relationship to the world, a relationship where it's not just taking from the mother anymore because we've fallen in love. And this is a mature love relationship that we are being invited into. Again, we're not going to be forced into love. We're not going to be scared into love. We're not going to be bribed into love. We're not going to be threatened into love. And that, that, that's some of the biggest strategic and rhetorical errors of the environmental movement, mm -hmm. to try to bribe and threaten people into love. No, that's not how it works. It's a choice. And the choice is not just to take, but to give also, to co-create. That's what mature love is. And so we don't just strip from the soil. We know that we, we and it's not just like a, a self-interested calculation that if I enrich the soil and build the soil, that it'll be good for me too. It's, I love the soil. I'm a partner with the soil. I love the worms. I love the biodiversity. I feel at home again. I feel wealthy again because I'm in relationship to all these beings. It's not just a medium for growth. It is, it is a community, and I'm part of that community. That's what we want. That's the choice that we face. And, and, and that soil, and you could talk about that in, in, in many, many other realms. So I'll, 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 I'll leave it up to, to each of you to um, sense the presence of that choice in your own lives. And, and I don't want this to be like a, uh, you know, an exhortation to start choosing. No, like, no, it's more like first a moment of like inner celebration and acknowledgement for like the choices that you've already made that are in service to a more beautiful world, that are in service to life, that are coming from love of this beautiful planet and to know that none of those choices were in vain, even if your campaign failed in its objective to stop fracking or something like that. It still made a statement. It still created a morphic field. And so to, to so to celebrate the choices that you have made, and then also to nod to that part of you that is ready and willing to continue making such choices and to bring them to new areas of your life where they have not been active before. And acknowledging that readiness starts a process in motion where you don't have to force yourself to do it. This is not another arena for domination inner domination, a war on the self that reflects the war on nature. You know, you see like the, the, the ways of the old story are very subtle. They, they, they come out even sometimes in our efforts to build a life in a new story. So yeah, thank you for, um, uh, honoring me with this invitation and with your attention. And, Thank you. Yeah. That was beautiful. Oh.
like the invitation. In my mind, right before you said, I said, it's an invitation. And you make a choice. And more and more of us are choosing. Yeah. And one way to, to help that choice along um, is to know <laughs> the it's the opposite of what the economist, biologist, politician, and priest thought about the people playing musical chairs, that they're in it for themselves and so forth. It's to actually be able to relate to other people and know that they want to make that choice. And maybe it's hard. Maybe they're scared. Maybe they have other habits. Maybe they've been indoctrinated in ways that make that choice seem naive or irresponsible. But if you can hold that knowing that that I know who you really are, you're somebody who's here for the same reason I am. Mm -hmm. We're here in service to life. I know you and I will remind you and I will create opportunities for you to exercise that choice. Then we become powerful. That's a totally different kind of leadership than than control based leadership. Yeah, I was pointing to you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lucia. Thank you for your talk. If you could speak up, that would be great. Oh, that was me speaking very loudly. <laughs> uh, my name is Lucia. Thank you for a great talk. What do you think of the role of carbon markets as a mechanism for incentivizing more people to regenerate nature at our current moment? I, I think carbon markets are very limited in the um, benefit that they can have, and often they have. Um, a perverse effect. They make things worse. Um, because uh, the main thing is there's a lot more to ecology than carbon. Earth is alive. And when we destroy her organs, we destroy the planet's ability to maintain a healthy climate, a stable climate. And so like a lot of what happens now in the name of reducing carbon emissions is to destroy ecosystems through a, a vast expansion of mining for the materials to make wind turbines and, and batteries. They're chopping down forests. And yeah. Did you see in Scotland? They chopped it down like tens of thousands of trees. You're like, what? Yeah. To save the yeah, I, 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 what? Right. Yeah, I met a woman, she was Romanian um, and and she like was, she like, you know, grew up in Romania, then went, then, you know, lived in the U.S. and then went back to Romania to like visit, you know, to like, she kept, became curious about her ancestry, you know, visited her grandmother. And like Romania has like some of the only old growth forests in Europe. And the logging truck after logging truck after logging truck, destroying the entire thing, it just broke her heart. And then she tried to find out where are they going. They were going to wood chipping factories oh. to make pellets to feed to converted coal powered power plants oh. that then got carbon credits. Oh my god! And the, and like so like what what's the problem here? The problem the problem is when we try when we when we imagine that we can measure, assign a metric, a single quantity to ecological health and then monetize that metric. Then we're gonna, we're gonna run into all kinds of problems like that because the people who design the metrics are gonna be the same people who profit from them. Yeah. And we have to understand that, that, that nature is sacred and, and we cannot simply value it by its carbon sequestration capacity. Now that said, there are people who can kind of game the system and get funding to do really great stuff using carbon markets and carbon credits. So like, you know, I'm not going to say don't sully your hands with, you know, uh, engaging the, the, the mainstream system, you know, like I think there's good arguments to be made for working in the system, working outside the system, like it's not cut and dried. And so some people are really doing good things like funding regenerative agriculture, um, building soil, getting carbon credits for that. Um, so, you know, but then there's some people who are gaming the system, like planting fast growing trees that get carbon credits really fast, but then deplete the groundwater and create a desert 
And the soil. And the soil, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah? So, Charles, I'm, I'm curious, you know, there's, I think more and more people are aware of the stressors on our planet and on society and for their own children and their own lives, right? So, there's a lot of wealth generated by this system. Can you imagine, how would you imagine, how could you imagine some of that wealth being channeled to accelerate, to fertilize things embedded more in the gift and what you're talking about? Or is the shadow of it so big that it, it can't actually work that way? You can't use top-down money to foster... Oh, you definitely can. Okay, so how can yeah. you imagine that happening? The fallacy would be to, be to say, I'm gonna make lots and lots of money so I can give it away. Yeah. That's robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. But a lot of people, like, they have inherited vast quantities of money from their ancestors or from an earlier time in their life. And then they have a change of heart. Mm -hmm. And th 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 those people are, are crucial, I think, mm. to, the, to the transition. Um, they're, like, because they can fund an awful lot of beautiful work. So what would you want them to be, like other specific principles or things that you want to be funding, especially around the gift and what you get into in sacred economics? Uh, yeah, there's <sighs> what I would like to see, and this actually has difficulty fitting into like tax law and stuff like that, and and the law around laws around philanthropy. But but um, just to like directly fund people who are working in the field, who are like you know reintroducing beavers, you know, and not only not getting paid for it, but like you know using their own money to support their hobby of ecosystem restoration. Mm. You know, people who are, who, who are, you know, doing social and environmental uh, repair um, and incredible work. And, and they're like, they're not applying for grants. They're too busy actually doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Like all the best projects are on a shoestring because they don't have grant writers and they're not on the radar of philanthropists. And sometimes they don't even fit into philanthropic paradigms. So, so they don't have yeah. a 501c3. Or right, they don't have a 501c3. Yeah. You know, they, they don't have an organization of that scale. So, but I, I, I'm not going to say, like, here's the one thing that should be funded. It's very much about relationship. It's the thing that should be funded is the thing that moves you. You know, it's the thing that gets under your skin. It's the thing that, that, that you're not just throwing money at it, but you have a relationship. Yeah. 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 Um, one thing when I think about, like, I like crave if there was just one choice to make, but unfortunately there's like a million possible choices. And I'm curious specifically about how you think about making choices that are trying to do good within the system. And when I say the system, I mean the monetary system versus ones without. So it's like, you know, you could use your, your current capital to, you know, remove yourself from the money economy in the sense, turn that into tangible resources, turn that into generosity, and yeah. Community with that. Or you could look for a way to invest it in a systemic thing that's operating within the monetary system that is hopefully going to yeah. change things at a higher level. How do you think about those types of options? It's very practical. You, you, you gather as much information as you can, and then you choose based not on that information at all but based on the alchemical effect that the information has when you take it in and it forms your, your perceptions and your care and then, and, and, and the relationships that you develop and then something is inspiring to you. you. Your rational mind may be able to say, yes, the reason that is inspiring is because I understand the, um, uh, uh, hydrological effects of healthy forests and therefore I'm excited about this project to restore you know forest watersheds okay maybe but maybe what inspires you and excites you and moves your care is something that your rational mind cannot say why it's important but you trust that once that information feeds in and you're open to 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 seeing things that maybe you had been blind to before. Like it's that kind of humility actually that creates the conditions for you to make wise choices that then lead to a fulfilled life. Yeah, so it's really a body function. Yeah. 
I'm getting kind of tired, guys. Um, <laughs> and I think a lot of people are also. So um, maybe Joseph. one or two more or something. Yeah, I just yeah. want to add here when I, um, when I hear you speaking about, like, I was imagining musical chairs. And I was imagining, well, what happens if actually we decide to like, stack them all together? Or where we make a pyramid out of them? Or when we decide, actually, we don't want to sit anywhere. <laughs> yeah, and we don't want to play the game. And uh, you, you alluded to some of the, some of the mystery works. And like, I, I wanted to say that uh, Charles is speaking tomorrow with some of the Yahoo Tech tickets. And we will have a uh, live stream and reporting on mysteryworks.com. And you, re you mentioned Revolution Roll Call. Do you mind if I? Speak to this Please. Um, that as the, as called the, the mystery works. Like there's a way that life's intelligence is animating us in ways that the system doesn't really understand. That um, that has this action quite unpredictable, where the intelligence isn't artificial but quite real, and quite relational. And um, some of the core function of revolution roll call and the mystery works is um, is actually an animation of. Uh, a uh, seed long planted by Charles, actually, not far from here at the Interval Center, and that was the thing, mm -hmm. um, that there is a more beautiful way. And of course, every part of, it, every part of us says, yeah, of course, of course. But to actually have the courage to create that world, um, like you're saying, is, is in relationship, is in love, is in, is in the rekinescence, is in actually making family again so that we can create our own um, uh, like substrate, actually, soil. Um, for life to do that inoculation thing she does, that inoculation, where, where actually um, there's, there's really mysterious forces that are actually in support of the kind of work that, that saves life and, and that regenerates it. And so um, in the spirit of that work, the mystery works. And um, yeah, the revolution will call is happening in May, just next door here. And um, I just want to thank you, Charles, for, for speaking to that piece about it's, it's like what actually lights you up and trusting, like, desire is the choice of choice. And, and that's actually how the evolutionary impulse works, is when we're like, I, I don't know why, but I love this. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but I give this everything. And actually trusting that and finding a place where we can weave that together and discover an intelligence that arises only from our, the, the imminent collective. Like the eminence of the collective. Um, so, all of you who are doing that work, and Charles is doing that work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, but I love this. That's, 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 that's life speaking. Life knows what to do. And we are life. Like, fundamentally, who are you? Your life. Your life in this human form. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to mention, I, I did bring some books. Um, and um, Aaron, you have a, a square reader. You can pay, pay whatever price feels right to you. Could be the cover price um, for, for these books, mine anyway. Um, could be the cover price, could be um, another amount, more or less, whatever feels good to you in your particular financial situation. Um, question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, first, I'd just like to thank you for your time I guess I'd like to know your perspective on what I see to be a problem. Um, I have a lot of respect for the idea of embracing morality on an individual scale and choosing life and um, choosing generosity is something that I think in your, in your uh, musical chair analogy makes sense for a uh, maybe a small number of people. Um, and then as, as societal pressures maybe make a larger number of people understand that maybe they don't want to choose a chair anymore, maybe they want to build their chairs into a pyramid, um, I think that there is a, a large number of those people who are choosing to sit in a chair maybe don't have the ability to make that choice. And it might be from an economic standpoint, it might be from the way that they're derived, raised societally, um, but I think that from an earth science standpoint, 
there's only so much fresh water that can melt from Greenland before the oceanic gyres freeze and the ability for everyone to get to that place before it's too late is, I don't know, it feels yeah. like question. So, so I'm not, I'm not offering, um, you know, gift economy and generosity as an alternative to working on a systems level. Like what makes you come alive? What makes you say, I love this and I don't know why? It could be um, work that, that we recognize as political. Um, another thing, there's one more thing I want to say about that. Um, but I forgot what it was. Dang it. The and this imminence of the collective. I, I love your work. I'm always super inspired by it. More beautiful world. Oh my God. And we all get that. But I'm just interested, and I should know, but I don't, how it just seems under-reported uh, about the amazing political opportunity that we have. We have a better way here. It, it, it'll work great. <laughs> So what do you, how do you feel about us banding together and, you know, making it happen with the tradition in democracy? Um, well, to the extent that we have a democracy, <laughs> which is not much, but again, like, it, it, again, it's the same thing where, where in a moment of, of crisis and breakdown, there's a window of opportunity to really change things. And I think that that is coming. Um, not sure if it's really gonna be mature in 2024 yet, but um, by 2028, I think that, that a lot of our uh, conventional wisdom could be obsolete. So, so yes, yes. Yeah, ultimately, this will have a political expression. It has to. It's not, not just about, you know, individual stuff. But the individual stuff is more powerful than we recognize because causality does not work the way we were taught it works. We were taught it works when a force pushes on a mass. That is Newtonian causality. And that, that mindset is itself very deep in the core of the mythology of civilization which is about mustering increasing amounts of force to be able to move, dominate, control more and more things in nature. That's what progress, technological progress has been. But it's based on a very limited understanding of, of change and of reality. Things can happen. I mean, what, what we think of as possible is a very narrow part of the spectrum of possibility. And, that's, and, and, and we tend to like take those anomalous things and kind of shunt them off into an alternative reality and, say, and, and keep them out of political conversations. But I don't think that our politics is ever going to change if we keep those things out that are actually coming from the worldview that we want to express in politics. And that's why it's so important to, for me like to, to constantly dip into the well of that which is outside the limits of conventional reality. You know, and, and I just like, I, I just recently read um, Maladoma Somme's book of Water and Spirit, you know, like beautiful book. Get the recorded version because it's him not just reading the book, it's him speaking the book. Beautiful, you know, and, 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 and you listen, listen to a work like that and you're like, okay, if I really take this in and accept it as real, not through a patronizing anthropological lens, not through the patronizing lens of, well, we must respect other cultures, but actually, like, this actually happens? This is actually possible? What does that do to your life when you feed that information through your intellect into your body? What different choices will you make? What assumptions were you holding that are not necessarily true about how change happens in the world? So this is, this is, this is important, you know, that, that we are more powerful than we were taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. would just like to add that Gaia is in a very abundant planet. She provides freely. You just have to tap into that flow. It's the scarcity mentality is what causes people to think that they have to hoard. The active vacuum has infinite energy density. All we have to do is tap into that. It's ubiquitously all around us. 
And we just have to tap into the natural flow of the universe for what already is. And right now we're working upstream. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Gosh, I'm getting tired, guys. <laughs> I'm trying to trying to set a boundary here. I'm, I'm, would you would yeah. you like to wrap up, or yeah. do you want a chair, or no, what I, would it make you comfortable? I, I feel like it's time to wrap up. Time to wrap yeah. up. Yeah, because there's like more and more. I mean, this is yeah. like really beautiful, and and yeah. I mean, this is also why like I mean another another thing for community, you know, to really, um, yeah, to to fertilize these these ideas and and and, and yeah, I'll, I'll I'll be back in Boulder. Um, but really, thank you, everybody, for your thank attention. You. Thank you, Charlie.